Ah, hantu temetik ni wago maganti. Ke nanas kumpul nawe kami na, emama iya. Nai nawe ni kisi, segala stepan itu gay na, licik di kate na anu ma, kita tu skai ni awa. Kewaste, nai na awa ma na awa ma, kai sip maci suak, kai si ayam iya, mina kai si aci muak. Friends and relations, we give thanks that we are able to come together. In the Cree language, movie making is called Chagaste Panichi Game. And this means that we cast and shine a light through the creative and technological endeavors. Movies, therefore, shine a light on our cultures, languages, histories, and stories. In addition to uh, different forms of relationships like kinship, which is Wagotuin, and Wichitwin, the helping supporting relationship, there are other relational forms we use. There is first the central idea of Ututemituin, which integrates the ideas of openness, friendship, and diplomacy. There is also Wichiyoganituin, partnerships, and the need to build alliances, or Wichiyoganituina. We are therefore also casting a light on the importance of relationships. How? Thank you, sir. Karanga mai o mai nga whakahi, mai o moana whakaora, mai o pau whenua, mai te hau mā taratara o runga, mai te hau mai angi raro. Karanga mai, karanga mai, karanga mai ki a ratau, E da koto mai ra i te anu anu i te mātau tau ki tua o te arai. Haere, haere atira. Karanga mai e koro, hei kanohi, hei rau atawhai mo to iwi. E rau rangatira, ngā kārangatanga maha o kānata o au te aroa. Me whakanui a tātou katoa ka tika, mo te hui ngā tūpuna ki konei, mo te hui ngā tangata ki konei, mo te hui ngā kaupapa ki konei, mo te hui ngā aroha i te nei rā. Hau ngi e, hui e, tāi ki e. We draw in the vast presence of the mountains, the sustenance of the seas, the landmarks of the earth, the freezing winds of the heavens to the light winds close to the earth, we draw them near. We acknowledge those who have passed on and farewell them on their journey. We honor our elder as the face and voice of his tribe and the hundred chiefs and many extensions of his people and ours. We rightfully celebrate the gathering of the ancestors here the gathering of the people here, the purpose of being here, and the collective respect and love here today. Steadfast, together, enriched, unified, assured, blessed. Kia ora. Kia ora. So Tully from Canada and Ontario Creates, the New Zealand Film Commission acknowledges the Indigenous ancestors' land language of Canada and Aotearoa, we welcome you all to this event, the Making an Indigenous Canada New Zealand co-production, specifically Night Raiders. Thank you to Keith for providing the protocol for today and responding from Aotearoa and providing the important foundation of this panel and indeed the way that this project differs from other co-production film partnerships. Um, the other coordinator and moderator, Adam Garnett-Jones from the Content Analyst and Indigenous Liaison from Telefilm Canada will join us shortly. 
Night Raiders is, a, is set in the year 2043. The military occupation controls disenfranchised cities in post-war North America. Children are property of the state. A desperate Cree woman joins an underground band of vigilantes to infiltrate a state children's academy to get her daughter back. Today, we have the Canadian producers, Paul Barkin and Tara Woodbury, and writer, directors, director, Dennis Goulet. Um, ko au, ko te o kahurangi wā ka tipu, ko taku mahi te pau whakahaere o te tumu whakaata taonga. So I'm the Māori Screen Executive at the New Zealand Film Commission, and my role is to lead the Māori strategy in the Commission and ensure support, funds, and greater considerations for Māori stories and Māori filmmakers. Today we welcome to the panel two of the three producers, New Zealand producers, tonight Raiders, Ainsley Gardner, te koe Ains, and Chelsea Wynn Stanley. So I just want to say thank you, uh, Kinner Skonten, so much to uh, Keith and to um, Karen for providing uh, the opening. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just start off by talking about the early phases of uh, production, um, not of production, of, of development. Um, if you can just walk us through the story's genesis and the journey through development and finding key partners, uh, including some of the people who are here with, with us today. Yeah, so I think I started writing it maybe about six or seven years ago. And um, around that time, I had just finished a short called Wakening, which was also set in a kind of dystopian near future. And Tara Woodbury and I had um, worked on that short together. And so we started developing this idea um, and really stayed in script development over those years, like probably starting around 2013 or so. Um, and we were just sort of very alone in the development journey. And then, you know, around 2018, we decided that we were, that the script was finally ready and we could, you know, take it out into um, partners. But, you know, I think I had always had this dream that we could make an international Indigenous co-production happen. Um, and, I, you know, like our Indigenous communities have been meeting on the festival circuit for years um, at, at all the major festivals, but also at the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival, which is like a global meeting place for Indigenous filmmakers. Um, so those uh, relationships were all, you know, already there and so ripe for something formal to happen. Um, but I think a lot of people had been holding a vision for an international Indigenous co-production. And we started seeing that happen with the circumpolar uh, nations up in the Arctic. And, um, you know, I early in the script had included a Māori character and I went to my friend um, who is uh, an incredible screenwriter down in New Zealand, a Māori woman. And I had her read it very early on and just kind of say, you know, what do you think of this? Can this work? And, and so with her support, we kind of like continued to work through, um, through what this could possibly be. And then I think in 2018, um, Paul Barkin came on as an additional producer on the Canadian side. And it was also in that year that I ran into Chelsea at um, a native lab that the Sundance Institute runs. And she had a read of the script. And we also started talking to Ainsley. And I think by the end of that year, we were actively trying to investigate how a co-production could actually happen. Um, but, you know, like there, this was in the works, you know, this idea, this vision for something like this was being held for many years. I think the National Screen Institute up here in Canada had run a program called the NSI Cultural Trade Program as early as 2003-04, um, where they were sending delegations of Indigenous folks from Canada down to Australia to see if that kind of collaboration will happen. So, you know, like these kinds of ideas um, have been a long time coming. And so it was very, very exciting when we started to actually get closer to the prospect. And then when we went in for financing in 2019 and it all started rolling into place, you know, we had Telefilm come on, it was very exciting. And then we were like just in the throes of it with Ainsley trying to figure out, you know, how we could make um, it all happened with the New Zealand Film Commission. So um, I, while I have this chance to thank everybody's efforts, it really was a dream come true for me and very exciting when it happened. 
I wonder if some of the uh, your producers from New Zealand would like to weigh in with what drew them to the project and how they got uh, how they got involved. Um, sure, kia ora. I'm Ainsley. I'm um, one of the New Zealand producers. I think um, as an individual, one of the most motivating things for me as an Indigenous um, filmmaker, as a Māori filmmaker, is the uh, the camaraderie amongst Indigenous filmmakers, as Dennis has already spoken to, through festivals, largely through festivals like Imaginative and through Bird Running Waters programs at Sundance. And there's been, you know, while we struggle sometimes in our own countries, when we come together and see the kind of collective success, I think that has built us all towards um, a kind of collective strength. Um, we've known Dennis for many years, as she said, she, she worked on the project early with Briar, mm -hmm. also with Taika having an input. And so when, uh, what, what was also exciting is when seeing her film Wakening, that we were all starting to move into um, spaces of storytelling that weren't the expected stories that we should be telling, but they were still inherently um, indigenous. So when Dennis wanted to tell a film like Night Raiders, it was really exciting. Um, and it was a no brainer really, a Misconception and Chelsea, we wanted to expand in a business sense um, as getting co-production experience. But our primary motivator was to um, support Dennis and disappearing into the background of Night Raiders, which is <laughs> as it should be. Um, and uh, just to support Dennis, um, we all know that collectively we are stronger, so her success is our success. I think it felt like a Maori film, regardless of the Maori character. It speaks to colonization and struggle and culture <laughs> and language. Um, my, I feel very moved watching the promo and hearing Dennis's language. Um, as the entry into a film like this. So um, that stood out. Um, and I think the nature of, of the, the global indigenous audience um, and our appetite for films like this is incredible and often overlooked and Charles will speak to that. Um, and I think when you're making a co-production, having some, to, we needed to ensure that it was a truly Maori film as well as a truly Cree film. Um, and Dennis's early work with Briar and the length of that relationship, I think, informed um, that. We also used a cultural tikanga advisor here, Ngā Paki Moitara, um, to develop the character of Leo and ensure his authenticity and his um, reason for being in the Night Raiders film. And then Lloyd at the Film Commission um, provided us with some mentorships, which just gave additional depth to the um to the to the yeah to the depth of the uh, collaboration between us fantastic i wonder uh tara if you could speak to um what drew you to the uh, collaboration i think that you're the producer who has been uh involved with the project for the longest when it was in development with dennis um could you speak to what, what drew you to the project and that process of collaborating with a group of Indigenous women? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that drew me to the project was having worked with Danis and the strength of her vision and her female-centered storytelling. Um, and, and I think because it was just the two of us kind of trying to figure something out and she was coming and going with the writing and we kept on coming back to what is the intent of this project? What are what a, what can I help you protect within this? And so that journey has been the same through the beginning, uh, the inception of the film all the way to now, which is mm -hmm. um, going back, doing gut checks and saying, what are we trying to do? Danis, what are you trying to do? What can I help you protect? And what can I support within that? And it's been a wonderful collaboration and working with, um, all these women from New Zealand and having this powerhouse of female producers on the film was an incredible experience. And I think we'll all be collaborating together well after this. Yeah, I hope so. And so Paul, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, how you managed to, to bring together the, the, these indigenous co-production aspirations uh, that everyone has been speaking about and making it uh, a reality on the producing side. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, like you all said before, um, it really was something that um, 
uh, you know, sort of have been around for a while that uh, Tara and Dennis, when I talked to them, they'd been developing it and the idea that um, this could potentially be a co-production with New Zealand was, uh, was very intriguing to me when the project was presented. I mean, I think what was always the biggest challenge, I think, was, um, was that it would, be a, would need to be a, quite a large budget um, for an Indigenous film and even for an independent film. Um, and so my sense was that in order to get to that budget level and to be able to be that sort of film, it needed, it, it was very important for it to become a co-production. Um, and then to also be a national project at Canada and then to be a national project um, as a co-production with New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I, I had some relationships uh, with New Zealand. I'd been looking to make co-production with New Zealand for a while. So it sort of was a really uh, kind of perfect time um, to be able to take this type of project. And the fact that it was um, there, it's, it's, it's universally themed and it was, it has, they, in the indigenous communities share similarities um, as far as the stories they want to tell. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing to be, to see how this story evolved from at least the Canadian perspective. And then as we involved the New Zealand producers and creators, how it was, it was, there was a, a great amount of kinship and, um, and universality. So I thought when I, when you could see that early on, I definitely was, was saying that, you know, we really need to push the uh, opportunity for co-production, um, which was always a challenge too, because, um, you know, it's, it's difficult, um, even in best of times to sort of coordinate the financing and activities of co-production when you raise your money in Canada and you raise, you need to find similar money that comes in at a similar time in New Zealand. So, we had to do a bit of a dance in order to do that. But the greatest thing about it was from very early on, um, there was really a real will between both Canada and New Zealand to make the co-production. Um, I think everyone recognized the great opportunity this could be in the story that, that Dennis wanted to tell. Um, and for me, it was just a great opportunity to work with such fabulous producers um, and to work with Dennis. I mean, uh, Tara and I have a long standing relationship um, for many, many years. We'd always been looking on uh, for a project to work together. Um, and she was so passionate about this project with Dennis. And, uh, you know, it, it's a first time filmmaker. Dennis, a first time filmmaker, a, a first feature. But, um, but this, uh, there was just something about this film and the sort of her concept around it and how to bring all of this together that I think also. Um, not only had a great cultural elements, but also had a level of commerciality that not only would be important for Canada and New Zealand, but also I think that the market would really relate to. And, um, and it's a sci-fi film. Um, it's, it's cool. It's set in the future. It's dystopian. I mean, all these things are really interesting. And, you know, we deal with this right now in our dystopia that we live in. So um, I, I, it, it just felt really timely. And I think, um, and you know, I think that that was a very big part of it. So it was kind of interesting to be able to not only bring the cultural elements and the, and the cultural support to this project, but also um, to a level the market support. In Canada, we um, really, um, with Elevation Pictures, with uh, Bell Media, CBC, um, the CMF, we had a lot of really great support. And of course, um, you know, Telefilm and OMDC, um, was really important to being able to make this together. And then on the New Zealand side, the New Zealand Film Commission. Kia ora, Paul, and to our Canadian brothers and sisters. Um, in addition to the aspects that have just been mentioned, Chelsea, I mean, you've had great success on Merita and how mum was, uh, how mum decolonized the screen, Jojo Rabbit. How did you become involved and what was important to you in being a part of Night Raiders? Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, na mahi nui kia koutou. Um, kia ora Keith and na uh, to you Karen for introducing and opening up today. Um, thank you for that mahi. Um, how, I was just incredibly lucky really to be a part of it. Um, I think anyone who has the opportunity to work with either Dennis, Ainsley, Tara Paul, anyone in the whanau, Eva, um, also Eva Thomas, who was my kind of Indigenous co-producing cohort there. You know, what an amazing, incredible group of people to come together. And like what Ainsley was saying, it's all about wanting to support. And there's a very much a, a whanau community aspect to, I think, anything we do as Indigenous um, practitioners in the arts. It's, it's very much 
community uh, driven. So I was just lucky enough to be um, in LA at the time. And Ains was like, hey, you know, she's very, very busy doing her own project too. So it was very much, can you jump up and go up to, to Canada? And I knew of the project as um, Dana spoke of before I'd read the script and I was absolutely, would do anything, do anything for her, do anything for the project. So um, it was fantastic to be a part of because I think we have this shared experience as Indigenous peoples, especially coming from colonial histories. So you have, um, you know, everything, shared trauma through to very much shared, shared stories to be explored and to be told. And so one of the things I really enjoyed and actually um, very much noted that we do was our specific Indigenous cultural practices. And, they, and that started, that was at the front and centre of this entire production of Night Raiders. And I felt like that for, for you know, for the first time really, that Indigenous uh, narrative was given that uh, authorship from very beginning to the end. And I think it's a very important thing to note because you want to make sure that you're setting the scene. And there was a beautiful uh, cultural historical induction that wasn't just for us mentors who came over, Kath Brown and Kudapai, Vicky Hunter joined me up in, uh, in Toronto, but it wasn't just for us, it was actually for the entire crew. And I think that's such an important thing to do because it was a beautiful thing to witness. A lot of crew didn't even really understand their own history, their own colonial history within that country. And I think that's very important because it set the tone and it meant that from that point on, there was no misinterpretation. And that's a very important kind of place to start, I think, when you are talking about um, these things that have very a lot of layers to them. So it was wonderful to be a part of that and see gen genuinely the crew were moved and a lot of them, you know, to tears actually, that they were being part of something so historical and could see, um, you know, because often I, I don't think people really take that much care to really surround their crew and allow them to be a part of the entire process. So I take my hat off to all of you for allowing us to be a part of that process. I think that was really important. Um, and then there were obviously things that we do also share here too in Aotearoa where Karakia, we would use that um, and we would do that as part of our shooting process whenever we start. And, and again, it's just setting the tone. So it felt like you were very much um, taken care of and you were, you were led from a very indigenous perspective from the beginning. So that I really appreciate. Thanks so much, Chelsea. It was an incredible feeling on set. I can, I can attest to how close that, that family feeling and that, that ind Indigenous collaborative uh, sense really came alive on, on set. It was, it was really an emotional place to be. Um, Tara, I'm just wondering if you can speak to um, the complexities of, of the shoot itself and managing all of these different elements uh, as an international Indigenous co-production, um, working with the, the various teams and the juggling mentorship. And if you could speak to what were the challenges that you were working with and um, what were the things maybe that, that went more smoothly than you would have expected? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's a cross-cultural production. So um, as Chelsea mentioned from the get-go, we, First of all, um, use pathways and protocols released here by um, Imagine Native as uh, our working document that we constantly referred to going through the shoot. And one of those recommendations was to have a cultural advisor come on and we made it mandatory for all of the crew to attend and made sure that that session uh, aligned with um, our uh, New Zealand um, counterparts coming over. We also built a mentorship program that was supported by Ontario Creates and the ISO, the Indigenous Screen Office here. So we had um, a bunch of Indigenous folk who were looking to get into film and or television, but were facing systemic barriers just to be able to get on crew to join us. Um, and Eva Thomas, who was a co-producer on our film, led that program. Um, she's an amazing, in up and coming indigenous producer. This was her first feature. And she, while also producing the film, also produced that entire program, which was incredible. Um, so we had a lot of indigenous folk on set. Um, and then we also had elders, including Keith, who's here today, but um, a variety of elders who, first of all, smudged some of our locations before we went into them and then were available um, to the actors and the crew as we went through. Um, the film specifically sometimes around some of the content that might have been triggering or traumatizing um, and then smudging available on set and you know 
all of the partnerships that you need to bring on board, whether it's from the crew to, you know, the financing partners, all of that partnership requires sometimes um, an education. And, and I felt that way um, as a non-Indigenous producer on this film, supporting Danis and her vision from it. So it was trying to go back to that original intent that Danis had set out in creating this film, protecting it all the way through from every single moment with the crew. And yeah, in a cross-cultural uh, production, there are challenges sometimes, but the big part I think was making space to sometimes, you know, slow the production, sometimes slow the prep, sometimes slow the creative process to make sure that we are still moving forward with the same intent. And, um, and sometimes that's, and, pathetical to the pace of production and the hierarchy of it, but how do we kind of push back against those and center it around values? So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we, we tried to do, you know, and sometimes it wasn't perfect and, um, uh, but it, we tried. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so interesting. It's, it's such a different conversation than um, we normally have when we're speaking about um, the productions of, of different kinds of films, whether they're co-productions or not. Um, in talking about protocols and talking about, you know, the, the intention of the, of the filmmaker to be making this, this piece of work, which is really announcing uh, Canadian Indigenous cinema to the world in, in, in a different and a new way. And making a first feature is hard enough as it is. Uh, I'm just wondering if Danis could speak to why all of this is so important to, to her. You know, why, why, why Danis, um, is it important to you to bring the language into the film, these cultural protocols into the film, to think about building capacity in the community while also making your, your, your first feature? Um, what, what, what is that about? Why, why is that so central to what you're wanting to do? Well, I think it has to do, well, first off, I would say Indigenous stories um, have been completely underrepresented and also misrepresented since the dawn of cinema. So we've been grappling with a hundred years of cinema history that have gotten our stories wrong again and again and again. And, um, you know, for me, you know, storytelling really is so important and who controls the narrative is so important and when we're in countries with colonial histories that have never given voice to the people that were colonized in order for that nation to form um that's really something that we have to start to address and so you know like very early on when i started in filmmaking i realized that you know the power lays in chelsea's point about authorship you know that we have to be in control of our stories in key creative roles but that it's not just about the storytelling itself. And I just also want to go, the, go back to development. You know, my dad, Keith, who introduced us, is very involved in, in my development. You know, as a part of the process, I go home, I talk with him, I record him, I think about um, Cree concepts because I'm not a fluent language speaker and he is. And so I really am trying to um, think about or like, you know, bring Cree thought into the process of developing the work. Um, and also, you know, all of these protocols around the production, um, you know, productions were not built for Indigenous storytelling. And so to Tara's point, you know, they are hierarchical. And if you want to be a values-driven project, you know, um, that often sometimes bumps up against the things that, you know, the way that film is always made or like the business or that kind of thing. And also, you know, I've been around the indigenous film community for many years and I've heard countless horror stories of people talking about the barriers that they face in the industry. And, you know, I think that if we want to start to try to do things in a different way, we just have to push into what does it mean to begin to change our processes and the way our spaces feel, you know, whether it's on set or, you know, in my, it, it was also always really important to me to create safe spaces for the actors because in the telling of Indigenous stories, even when you're protected by fiction, you know, actors are still very much bringing their own lived experience to, to the role and, you know, we have to work really hard to protect them. So sometimes it meant, you know, like, when we hired our first AD that, you know, I talked a lot about values and to make sure that he would become a protector in that. So 
So even though, yes, he's protecting the clock, he's also protecting, you know, the actor's process so that if we need to slow down, and we did at times, or we needed to find a smudge, um, you know, which is, which is a way of cleansing if you're having a difficult time, um, that we had the space to do that. Um, and that I feel was supported by Paul and Tara from the beginning. And, and it goes without saying that all of our partners from New Zealand already knew those values. And so it was just us coming together to try to make it happen. Um, but, you know, Chelsea's also brought up the point, which was the couple hours of training that we did for the entire crew, which was basically Colonial History 101. And it was sort of inviting the crew into the space to say, we're telling a story about something and this is what we're addressing directly so that they understood, you know, where the story was coming from. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even when I look back on it, I'm like, it was huge. Like it was so gargantuan. Like I can't even, you know, we pulled it off. We did it. <laughs> yeah, you really did. Well, thank you so much for all of your leadership on that. Oh, sorry, was somebody coming yeah. in? Can I just ask to um, Ainsley around what Dennis has spoken to and on the actual production, it's something that we are used to doing, but bringing the whole co-production, I guess the financing and how that may be better suited to support an Indigenous production. How was that for you as a producer on this? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things I'm still kind of working through and, and you know, doing two hours of culture, cultural history 101 is awesome. And I, two hours is just not enough um, in many ways, but it's fantastic that we had it. And I think, um, as Dennis has said, in New Zealand, we are used to building our productions around protocol, cultural protocol, but we still... Um, suffer a little bit from those co cultural protocols not extending deeply enough into our financing um, practices and even at, and in a co-production you've got these quite rigid measures to determine um, <clears throat> to determine whether it's a co-production or not so you know obviously our indigenous structures are incredibly robust from centuries of development and refinement and they're not always easy to articulate so I think there's a, a goal that we need to have around um, just more conversations with our indigenous communities and our funding bodies about how to um, extend that back from production and into those processes including at least two hours of cultural history 101 prior to these these conversations I think um, the the way of measuring um, co-production elements and things may not yet extend um, deeply enough into our cultural practice. Uh, you know, like we have to have um, a, a certain number of people and a certain number of elements, but I think that there are elements that are deep within Dennis's film, which as I spoke to earlier, make it a, a Maori film as well that aren't necessarily on the checklist for um, compatibility and I think moving forward that's something we need to look at. I think the um, one of the big successes from our point of view was the menteeships and um, I think that for Indigenous people direct relational experience is what strengthens us independently and collectively and I would like to see how we might um, build that even further as I say, rather than separating elements, are there ways that we can work together even more meaningfully? So post COVID-19, obviously we had to adapt um, to working creatively, um, using technical means more than being in a room. Um, I think it's gone really beautifully. I think both Canada and New Zealand feel very strongly that this is a, um, a, a true partnership and a true, collaboration, I'd like to see how, rather than saying, okay, well, New Zealand, you do this, and Canada, you do this, how we can do it even more collaboratively. So the music for Dennis's film is also a New Zealand Canadian um, co-production, and how can we, you know, we had Kudapai, who works in costume, working with um, the Canadian costume designer, and I think that was, uh, a much more sort of symbiotic relationship as a result of being able to 
work together that way. So that, that these are just things I'd like to, that we're, we're learning a lot about from having done this, that have worked really well, um, but I, I definitely see, particularly in our um, processes, processes prior to production, how can, we can build these same kind of aspects in um, to the, the preceding processes. I want to also ask um, of Chelsea, given the breadth of the, some of the work that you've done, both at a, we've talked a lot around the cultural and trying to balance that cultural and the commercial distribution, the other elements of making a successful co-production. Do you want to speak to the whole conversation around how to make a sustainable business and have a, a value of cultural distribution? Yeah, kia ora. So I feel like that is probably one of the biggest hurdles we have yet to face is how do we make a sustainable indigenous practice out of filmmaking because at the moment, you know, the system pretty much is as a business and you have to like the the policy as it sits at the moment is you you have to have distributors or sales agents kind of value your work and, and give you the kind of big tick and whether or not your product is sellable in order to then trigger some funding. And I think we really need to look at that because part of the making indigenous film, as Dennis was talking about, is, is really the history of it has been so misinformed. I mean, so many misrepresentations that a distributor and a sales agent has what really is a distorted view of what an indigenous film is and we really need to support language and culture in a way that again allows us to have control of that narrative from beginning right through to the end and um you know i think it's it's we have to we have to basically smash the western art canon that sits in and around what indigenous film is because it's completely mis, mi, misinformed so i would kind of love to see sales agents and distributors really embrace what a film like this is going to be able to do. I mean, case in point, when we did Moana Reo Māori in New Zealand, we outdone the Pākehā or non-Māori audience threefold. And it just goes to show there is an audience that exists. And I think for a long time, perhaps uh, distributors and sales agents don't realise that there is a huge Indigenous audience that exists. We are ready and willing and we've been waiting for so long to have our stories represented and told and then marketed in the right way you know so I'm hoping that in the future and and maybe this is being done with Night Raiders as well but that we embrace what that cultural element can do and can add to the marketing of such a film like this and into the future because um you know we have to we have to there's an audience that exists and we're ready and we're hungry and we're waiting just more to that uh, that same point, Chelsea, do you think that um, there's some education that needs to happen with uh, those distributors about the parallels between Indigenous histories, colonial histories in different countries to understand how, um, uh, what, what the market potential of those stories might end up being? Because the way that you're speaking about the, that untapped audience feels like it should be really appealing to distributors. Yeah, I mean, you know, um... There was research done recently um, by Crystal uh, Echohart, I think, and she said that there's like a, at least a billion indigenous people on the planet. So that in and of itself, distributed sales wow. agents out there, and we share a lot of these, uh, the, the shared colonial history, those stories resonate, um, you know, and they can flow down. And we understand what that means because it's, it can, it's trauma, it's trauma triggering most of the time, but we you have to be able to work through that together. And so you can relate to someone else's, like we have this, this film is a, a perfect example of that. But if that audience exists out there, I mean, that should be making distributed sales agents just like go crazy, you know, but they need to invite us into that conversation. They can't just be thinking, oh, thanks very much. Um, that's a lovely little colonial handshake I'll have there and I'll take your product. They have to embrace us into that conversation. They have to have us part of it. They can't be going, it just, it's not, it's not going to stand anymore. It's 2020. <laughs> Thank you. That's terrific. Um, so I guess this is really throwing, throwing out to, to, uh, everyone on the panel, but, um, looking back, uh, at the, the production, and this is a question from somebody who's, uh, attending the event. Um, what for all of you was the most difficult thing about putting the co-production together uh, and what was the, the easiest thing? Financing. Most difficult. Mm. Most difficult. <laughs> Always. 
I, I just think it's the coordination is the timing. You know, these things are really hard to put together. Um, they take a lot of will, uh, a lot of, and, and so many things have to come together. I, I got to, you know, Tara and I were talking about this, but it, I think that that was probably one of the biggest challenges was just timing it all. You know, Dennis, it was very important for Dennis um, uh, to seasonally to shoot at a certain time of year. And, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to capture a certain look. And, you know, when you get the momentum to build and build and build, but then, you know, there's all these other factors that you have to coordinate. So it's, mm. it, that to me was probably one of the biggest challenges. I'd just like to add to the financing thing and, and this speaks to what Paul is saying as well. So many moving parts. I'd love to see that process refined too. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to come together. Um, that, that a lot of the work maybe can be done before us. Um, less paperwork, less time, less, you know. Um, but yeah, that made it really difficult adding all that though those moving parts to the the just logistical moving parts of Dennis wanting to film. So it's, that mm. makes it a bit tough. What was the easiest thing then in the production? You know what you know what was easy is um, once Dennis had the script that she was happiest with, actually the Canadian funders really did embrace it. And you know we we can say the financing and the the timing is tricky, but you know, our Canadian partners and actually New Zealand Film Commission as well, like everyone really got behind the vision. There was, there's, there's an initial will and then there's also all the structural systems that make it tricky in terms of timing and um, you know, when, when people you know, release their funding and all of that. But the will actually was there early on and, um, and it was really exciting. And I felt like our momentum carried us forward. I've got one question that's come in too, um, to you, Dennis. What was the most difficult step to take once you had your script ready? Uh, I actually found writing the script absolute torture. So um, I felt like I was in purgatory for many years. And then once it was ready, I actually found that it came together quite quickly. You know, um, like those last, when we finally did take the script out to financers, it sort of just started to fall into place and it was more just things about you know like as we got closer to production like we kind of were cursed on finding locations and we had sort of a location fallout um i think for me you know the responsibility of holding something that is trying to be so many things to so many people um is just a really big task uh psychologically and also we were you know, the first international Indigenous co-production between Canada and New Zealand. We were also the highest budget Indigenous directed film ever made in Canada. Um, and so, yeah, and so all of these things were really exciting, but, but I think all of us had to carry, all of us as partners were shouldering the load of what we were trying to do together. I'm aware in regards to responsibilities that our timing is coming, um, time to sort of wrap up, but I just want to throw to our um, New Zealand producers and acknowledging also Georgina Condo, who's part of this team, but isn't on the call. Ainsley, Chelsea, is there anything you want to add to the sort of final inspiration to all of those that are watching that want to do a, not only a co-production, but an Indigenous co-production? I'm, I'm not sure, sure if it's inspiration, but my dad always talks about a cup, 10 cup of tea process that is required when you go into Indigenous communities. And as we've spoken to, Dennis and I and Chelsea, we've known each other for a very long time. So the building of relationships with your partners mm. takes time and it's necessary that it takes time. And um, there is no quick fix in order to do things meaningfully and well. So build your relationships before you build your film. Yeah, relationships are super important and we're only here because we are literally um, those that have been and come before us, like Merita Mesa, who was a mentor to all of us on this panel, you know, um, she really paved the way and she was instrumental in making those relationships happen, forging those relationships between our um, countries and communities and Indigenous brothers and sisters and we will be forever grateful to her. So we kind of just need to keep going, keep the momentum going. Um, this is the beginning of something that really is going to be a beautiful thing for the future. More, more, more. 
Um, just hey for kapi i totato um, to just closing up on our side. Just wanting to thank um, Tally from Canada, Ontario Creates, Mache de Film, Festival de Cannes, um, and Kenga Mihi, Kenga Mana, Kenga Reo, Ongai Wio Kanata, Neira, O Aotearoa. Em hi kaua tu kia koto mo manaki tanga kia mato nga kai hotu nga kai mahi nga kai papa hoki nga fakaranga tira koto ia mato mahi mauri ora kia tato. To the people of Canada from Matera and Aotearoa, New Zealand, we acknowledge your care of us, the producers, our workers, and our intention for the co-production. You've truly honoured us. Mauri ora. Can I just come to Karen? I heard uh, Dennis. I think wanted to. Um, have a final word and I'm wondering if uh, Dennis you can speak to um, when the film will be released when we can when we can see it what uh, what's next for you and the, the premiere of the film yeah thank you um, we are still very much dug into post we expect to be done sometime this fall for a release in 2021 um, but I also just wanted to say to the panel that um, and to everybody out there you know I think cinema has always been thought of and categorized under these umbrellas of national cinema. And I think what Indigenous cinema offers is very natural global partnerships that um, are brought together by our own solidarity of shared experiences within colonized countries. And so I think, you know, the umbrella that Indigenous cinema sits under is quite different than the way that national cinemas have been um, categorized in in the past and so I think it should be and can be looked at in a different way that just brings forward really exciting possibilities. That's a terrific note to close on. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, well, on behalf of Telefilm Canada, I want to say to our partners, the New Zealand Film Commission and Ontario Creates and to all of the, the panelists here today. I think it was a really wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, Keith uh, Denige for opening the gathering for us in a good way. Um, I realized that I had some technological problems at the beginning, so I didn't get to introduce myself, but my name is Adam Garnet Jones and I am the lead of Indigenous Initiatives for Telefilm Canada. Um, but um, I guess with that, Keith, I'd like to leave the, the final words to you. Yes, uh, I was uh, very pleased uh, to be uh, part of this uh, panel. Uh, I mean, this gathering. And uh, I, I saw it in a very strong developmental sense. You know, I, for, the, for the longest time, we had been dealing with uh, colonization, you know, from governmental say, uh, systems, private systems, etc. And our answer had always been self-determination. And recently, as we are moving along, we are now moving into the co-determination level. And we're seeing the co-determination level in forms of alliances and partnerships, not only within countries, but internationally. I think this, this step is a very important step in dealing, dealing with that uh, uh, developmental collaboration, not only at our levels, but with uh, New Zealand and, uh, and Canada, but also between the Maori and the Cree. And I, and I, and I thought this was a very, very important development. And uh, so I was very, very pleased to be part of it. And so I say, you have done a great development in the history of films.